everyone. Thank you very much for joining this presentation. Uh, thank you, Catherine, for the introduction, and thank you, Amit, for sponsoring this session and for inviting me to speak. I'm very excited to do that. My name is Amy Dimant. I'm the Director of Application for Advanced Pathology Services at Invicro, and today I will be presenting on cryofluorescence tomography. Uh, I've been using cryofluorescence tomography, Invicro has been using cryofluorescence tomography tomography for several years now, really since its early days, uh, until uh, what we have become now a, a pretty powerful imaging modality. Uh, so I was asked by, by Catherine, by me to uh, uh, share some of the latest insights that we, we have on preclinical application with Zira, which is the CFT imaging system developed by MIT. So today my talk will be divided into basically two parts. The first part will be an introduction of CFT modality, I will be going over Zira's features and advantages, uh, and then discuss some uh, CFT as compared to other imaging modalities and how we can use them in combination. And then we'll basically present case studies, which is why I'm here. Uh, we have quite a lot of um, examples and case studies that, we, uh, uh, that we've done. I chose um, a four of them that I, I, I think provides a kind of a good broad uh, uh, cap understanding of the capabilities, uh, really showcase uh, the modality. You'll notice we have an, an example for a uh, use for oncology uh, study, for neuro gene therapy by distribution, a multimodality, which I think all of them are multimodality studies, all those that I will present. So kind of really a, a good mix of really to showcase the, the modality and the applications. So that we're on the same page. Um, and we know we all know what CFT is and, and what Zira is. I, uh, I I got a few slides from Amit to just present uh, Zira specs. So this is Zira. Um, you can see it kind of uh, it, it's basically looking like a, a really sleek uh, cryomacrotome with an optical system uh, placed above, which is here in this tower that you see here. So the block is kind of in the middle. This is obviously maintained at minus 20. Uh, we have a uh, 12 megapixel high resolution camera, um, as well as dedicated lasers and filters. We have six channels basically, which provides us with a, a really good uh, flexibility in terms of selection, selection of fluorophores visible to NIR. Uh, Zira, have several, uh, Zira has several features. I'm gonna go through them. Um, Kind of quite fast, but uh, uh, I will in a couple of slides. I will be presenting CFT kind of the inside of the system. So uh, you will probably then uh, a lot of those will make more sense, will be more understood. But if you're looking at the features of Zira, there's quantification, the ability to measure the quantitative mean versus intensity, provide comparative analysis. Uh, we are able to get down to macro resolution, uh, down to 20 micron voxel size. The system is automated. Uh, which means we, uh, the, and, and again, it's gonna make sense in a, in a couple of slides, maybe more, but this, the, the, the serial, the serial slicing, the serial sectioning and image acquisition, it's, it's completely automated. Um, it's easy to use in terms of preparation of the samples and setting the system up for imaging. And lastly, we are able to image in, in 3D, which is a uh, really uh, a great feature and a great advantage, which leads me to the advantages of the system, again, with great features comes great advantages. So really resolution is, is uh, uh, really, uh, um, really good advantage for the system, for this modality. Uh, the ability to go down to 20 micron voxel size is really great considering we're still imaging pretty large volumes. We're imaging whole animals, whole, whole rats, several samples. Uh, so really maintaining such high resolution is really advantageous. Uh, also higher sensitivity, definitely compared to um, in vivo fluorescence, and also you'll understand why in the next slide. Um, because we have large blocks um, in which we're imaging the sample, so the throughput is pretty good as well. We can uh, image several mice, uh, several organs in the same block at once, so really nice uh, throughput. Uh, it is also very robust in the sense that we can use CFT combined with other imaging modalities, with in vivo imaging modalities, definitely with the in vivo fluorescence, they really go hand in hand, uh, but also microscopy and pathology uh, by the fact we're getting close to that resolution. It is streamlined in the sense that there is no fixation, there's no perfusion, 
uh, no decalcification, we uh, uh, just freeze the animal as is embedded an image. Uh, and it's versatile, again, in the sense, in, in the, in the uh, flexibility in choosing fluorophores, we can uh, a pretty broad range of, of spectrum that allows us to uh, properly choose our fluorophores and image several fluorophores at once as well. So this is, I'm gonna stop this for a second because I wanna go through the images on the left quickly. So this is how the kind of system looks in the inside. This is uh, how we set up the block. We have OCT, this is the whole mouse frozen with freeze first, then embed. Uh, we have fiducials installed. You see those black noodles there. Uh, but basically this is how we prepare the sample. We then uh, place the block in system in the CFT, in the, in the Zira. Um, and then th what happens inside is a sequential section image acquisition cycle cycle throughout the entire sample. So here you see the face of the block and the lasers exciting the fluorophore, uh, in this case it's GFP. We're also collecting white light information. You will notice that since we only freeze the animal, we have a lot of anatomical information. We capture that by collecting white light as well. So we do fluorescence and white light imaging throughout the entire sample every time we section. You can see here, the blade now sectioning one uh, section off, and then we would image the remaining block, then we would section again, image the remaining block. We do that throughout the entire sample, so eventually we end up with hundreds of planar images, both in the fluorescence and white light channels. We use uh, the fact that we have those fiducials installed here, and the fact that if you noticed the, 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 um, the stage is stationary, uh, only the blade moves, those two factors really are allowing us to perfectly align and reconstruct the data into a 3D volume. So standard, a CFT image output really looks like that. This is what we provide our sponsors when we're running CFT studies. Uh, MIP, the, uh, you can see the reconstructed uh, image on the uh, bottom left. Here you're looking at uh, AV9 mediated GFP expression in whole mouth uh, following IV administration. So you see a lot of signal in the liver. Uh, uh, you can see the heart here spinning. Um, and another thing which is pretty cool, the ability to detect and resolve structures like the DRGs, for example, you can see them kind of running along the spine here and AV9 known, is known to have eye into DRGs. It's pretty unique um, and it's pretty great because this is really small structures that are really deep in the tissue. Um, and uh, another kind of feature um, or kind of output of the system is this uh, um, uh, fly-throughs we are, able to use this flight through now to really understand the, uh, get some anatomical context. Uh, in some organs are really obvious, like the liver, very easy to spot the liver even without this white light information. But DRGs, lymph nodes, a lot of other smaller organs, which if you only see the reconstructed fluorescence image, sometimes you really don't know what they are. So the ability to have this white light information is very useful. Um, here again, you can see kind of the, the flight through of the entire as a GFP overlaid with the white light information. And lastly, we uh, keep our voxels isotropic or transform them to be isotropic so that we are able to visualize the sample in any orientation we want, regardless of how we've actually sectioned. So this is how we've sectioned the animal in this transverse orientation, but we are then able to view it in any orientation we want. And again, pretty useful when we are looking throughout the sample, uh, looking at the bad distribution of your compound. Another um, um, nice thing to have with CFT is the flexibility in, uh, in sample volumes. We, uh, there are several sizes of blocks which provides the ability to image also really large volume. Our largest block we can fit in a whole sino head, for example. So you see on the left here, that's a whole sino head. In the middle, that's a rat brain and a mouse kidney on the right. Uh, so really have quite a big Quite a lot of flexibility, and again, we at in vitro we've imaged whole mice, whole rats, whole sinus head, um, several organs at once. I'm going to go through those in, uh, in the case studies, uh, but it's pretty uh, uh, very useful. And one one thing to note is that uh, since we're taking one image of the entire field of view, um, the basically the field of view will dictate the the sample will dictate the field of view. The field of view will uh, determine resolution in a sense. Uh, because uh, the resolution will, uh, the, 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 the field of view will uh, either increase or decrease based on the volume. Um, it's not a, really not a big difference anyway. The difference between the smallest field of view and the largest field of view 
is about 30 micron voxel size. So smallest field of view, we get down to 20 microns and uh, largest field of view, we're at 50 micron voxel size. So still in the micron range, uh, but just something that we are keeping in mind as we're designing studies. Um, and in Vicro, we, we, I don't know if some of the uh, audience here, here know us, but we, we, we do a lot of um, preclinical work with uh, various imaging modalities. We like to say that we are modality agnostic, and uh, the reason we uh, say that is because we have the luxury of be being modality agnostic. We have all of those modalities at our disposal that we can basically pick and choose based on the, uh, the scientific question, based on the aim of the study. Um, and as we're doing that, kind of this is the, what we have in mind. Uh, we know that if we're doing in vivo imaging, if you're looking at whole animals, large volumes, typically resolution will take a hit. You're not down around the, the millimeter resolution. Um, if you wanna increase your resolution and then start asking questions, uh, where in the tissue is it getting into the brain? Um, we, we cannot answer that using in vivo imaging, then we go down to microscopy, we collect sections to answer those questions, but then you're gonna take a hit on volume. There's only so much, so many sections one can take. Um, so CFT, and it really bridges the, the void between the in vivo imaging modalities where large volumes, low resolution versus microscopy, low volume, uh, high resolution by allowing us to still image large volume, you can image whole animals, but resolution is much higher, getting closer to, uh, to microscopy. It's still at cellular resolution, but it's pretty high resolution. Um, and as I mentioned, in, in Invicro, we, we, we understand that there's uh, all those various modalities, they have advantages and disadvantages, and we, we actually like to do multimodality studies so that one uh, uh, imaging modality can complement the, the, the other. For example, here you can see that uh, the disadvantages of optical imaging uh, are actually the, the features, the advantages of SPECT imaging. Uh, so understanding that, we we like to design studies that are multimodality, and we've used CFT in many of those studies to, again, to kind of bridge the void, the, this gap between the, the in vivo and, and microscopy. So an example for a type of image, for example, uh, um, and again, as I, I mentioned, that in vivo fluorescence goes really end in end with CFT. So here is an example for, and I'm gonna go through this specific case study in, in later, later on, but just quickly showing you kind of how we use CFT and how CFT compares to, in this case, in vivo imaging. Here we're looking at size 7 tagged macrophage tracking in a, um, a tumor bearing animal. You're looking at the tumor here under IBIS, so the animal is anesthetized at size 7 um, that you're looking at. And this is, we collected several time points. This is one of those time points. At the terminal time point, we sacked the animal and did CFT to see what else we can see, what, uh, what added information we can get. Uh, so we uh, took down the animal, we, uh, again, the same animal, frozen, embedded, and image using cryofluorescence tomography, looks like that. Uh, so again, you're seeing the tumor that you're seeing here, but you're seeing so much more. And again, the resolution as well, so liver, lymph nodes, bone marrow, a lot of other organs that we were unable to detect in this, uh, in this case at least, uh, we're able to use the image using um, CFT and just to kind of sober the eye, uh, um, we, there's all fluorescence, uh, we always control for that, we are aware of that and control for that. You see here uh, a control animal, uh, no fluorophore in it, here you're only looking at the uh, uh, chow, at the uh, gut, which is uh, a fluorescent mostly because of the chow, that's something we can also reduce by uh, feeding the animal that far from the chow. So finally, I'm getting into the case studies. Uh, since I just presented in vivo fluorescence and, and, and CFT. So the first case study uh, is a case study where we've done a kind of screen type by distribution study, looking at ASO distribution versus um, ASO driven expression. It's a transgenic model where ASO drives GFP expression. And we kind of did a, kind of was a screen type study. We've uh, looked at various administration routes, uh, various time points, uh, to really understand the, uh, the the distribution and the kinetics of, of the test article, of ASOs in this case. I'm going to be presenting basically two administration routes, intrathecal and intraocular. So again, you're looking here at the at PK, in a sense PD, because we look, we're going to look at GFP as well, but PK, PD, and biodistribution of Sci-5 ASOs. 
uh, following, in this case, following intrastic administration. We've collected several time points uh, following administration. So you can see here, pretty consistent, strong signal across the, uh, across the spine, going all the way into the head. Um, you're also seeing, uh, at least in the supine here, you know, uh, signal in the lymph node, some clearance. Uh, so you're getting this 2D information here. Uh, for example, just something to note here that there was kind of this, you see this space in between the brain, the head, and the, the thoracic, the cervical, which kind of doesn't light up, which is kind of strange. Um, as you take down those animals, so at the terminal time point, which was day 15, we took down the animals and we conducted CFT. So now you're looking at the 3D uh, distribution as opposed to the 2D distribution. You are, I hope you can appreciate the increase in uh, resolution, the ability to really see the understand the distribution along the spine and uh, sensitivity, uh, which is, you, you can see here that for example, this part that was not imaged, we probably didn't detect it because it was going deep into the, into, the, into the tissue, so we couldn't detect it. It's definitely there. So we got this 2D and now we have this 3D bar distribution uh, using cryo process tomography. Another administration uh, route was intraocular administration, in which we've administered one eye, the other eye was uh, left uh, non-touched. We didn't administer anything. So you can see here, signal in the eye at day one, and it kind of goes down as it goes to day 15, nothing in the other eye. If you look at CFT at day 15, you will notice that if you would look at day 15 in IBIS, you would think maybe this is the, the test article is no longer there. It's definitely still there. We're seeing Psi 5 ASOs in the, in the eye at day 15 uh, pretty nicely. You also wanted to look at GFP as well. Uh, what we see here is mostly out of fluorescence. You can see both sides of the animal, not really seeing any signal from the eye besides a ton of auto fluorescence. When you're looking at CFT, now, instead of Psi 5 channel with a GFP channel, you can see that there's some signal in the eye here. Uh, kind of hard to really see that using this uh, spinning uh, reconstructed um, image. So we here we've used the white light information, this overlaid images. So again, you look at Psi 5 here, uh, which we discussed, you see a lot of signal in the eye. I would note that you see this signal here uh, right below the eye, that these are the arterial glands. This is autofluorescence. Um, if you look at GFP, you can definitely confirm that the administered eye, we are seeing GFP expression. You can see here uh, uh, GFP signal as opposed to nothing in the contralateral. Um, and again, autofluorescence, GFP is uh, probably the worst channel to work with. There's a lot of autofluorescence there. So we see that with CFT as well. Uh, the skin here is autofluorescence. But that is one case study. Another case study that, that another case study that I wanted to present uh, is looking at uh, it's gene therapy and uh, or, um, CMS, looking at AV distribution versus AV expression. And here we've also uh, it wasn't uh, uh, the the in vivo was done using SPECT, so we labeled AV capsid with iodine 125, administered them intrathecally, also tracked their distribution. At several time points, you can see pretty fast cholesterol distribution into the brain, into the head at uh, several uh, really early time points. At up to 29, 29 hours, um, iodine is no longer attached and you see it in the thyroid. But we were able to kind of look at the kinetics uh, of AV uh, for an intrathecal administration in rats. Uh, we then wanted to look at AV mediated expression. To do that, we've allowed the animal to recover waited four weeks for IRFP, which is what those AVs were carrying, uh, for IFP to express so that we can image the uh, IRFP expression and then compare distribution versus expression. Uh, so this is what it looks like. We actually were interested only in the vertebra. So we collected the entire vertebra of this rat uh, with CFT on it. And you can see this uh, um, reconstructed image on the left here, looking at IRFP expression along the spine. We were then able to co-register uh, the CFT data and SPECT CT data acquired four weeks apart into the same volume so that we can really compare them and, and look at the, at the differences. And as you can probably see, there's, there's a difference there between distribution of AV and the uh, following expression. We were also further able to confirm that the IRFP expression that you're seeing here 
is completely outside the vertebra. Although the uh, administration was successful with seeing um, this clearance, you seeing this um, distribution all the way to the, the head. However, the expression was outside the vertebra, and we were able to confirm that by collecting sections. Again, that's another advantage of CFT, the ability to collect sections from the same uh, sample and, and go to a microscope to confirm. So here we were able to confirm that IRFP expression is indeed outside the vertebra. And the reason for that was because, if you remember, we waited four weeks until we had sufficient IRFP expression. During that time, we did not remove the catheter. So there was a wound in the lumbar, uh, uh, in the lumbar portion uh, for this entire duration, which probably ended up in some AVs you know, leaking out and, uh, and expressing surrounding tissue. So again, another nice example for using CFP with nuclear imaging uh, to, uh, uh, to really look at two things that you need, you need each of those separately to, to answer. Uh, third case study is really, again, really cool study that we were able to publish uh, work done with Bargen and Ionis looking at ASO pharmacology. So similarly, we wanted to first understand the kinetics, the clearance of uh, ASOs following intrathecal administration in rats. So here you see uh, following administration, again, very similar to AVs, pretty fast rostral distribution into the, into the head. We're looking at after four hours, you're seeing renal clearance, you're seeing the kidneys, you're seeing signal in the, in the lymph nodes. Um, but the question was also, okay, we got the kind of the kinetics data, we got the uh, clearance. Is it getting into the brain? The target are, uh, was, in this case, was the brain. And the question, are the ASOs getting into brain parenchyma, which we are unable to answer using SPECT because we don't have sufficient resolution. To do that, we switch from SPECT to craft versus tomography. Instead of uh, iodine 125, we've labeled ASO with size 7 and conducted a PK-like study um, in a similar manner, I'm, I'm doing this because each of those brains uh, is a separate, it's a different animal we, uh, that we're basically taking down in different time points, which was also interesting because the way we determined we chose those time points was based on spec data. So kind of the spec data guided us into determining which time point we want to take animals down. Uh, so you can see here six animals following, uh, uh, taken down at several time points. And really similar or, or in, 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 in agreement with spec data, you're seeing a lot of signal, uh, a strong signal in the earlier time points, most of it. Now you can, you have the resolution to say that the, it is in the meninges, you can uh, see blood vessels there, for example. But over time, you're seeing that the signal diminishes, which is consistent with ASO's clearance that we've seen using spec. But the signal also becomes more diffused, uh, suggesting that it's getting into the parenchyma, um, into, uh, into uh, potentially into cells. And to really further confirm that, we uh, collected sections from those same brains. Um, you can see here the kind of one of the planes uh, of those uh, brains during CFT. You can see the kind of signal overlay. Um, at those time points, we collected sections. Um, at those planes, we collected sections and, and conducted immunofluorescence for various cellular markers. Um, also, you see here SMA, RECA1, to really characterize and understand the fate of ASOs following intrathecal administration. If you look at the right image, you can see that we're able to co-localize uh, ASOs with neuronal nuclei. You see those yellow dots there. So confirming that ASOs are getting into the parenchyma, getting into neurons, uh, but still, a lot, a lot of it remains in the meninges. You can see in, in green here, a lot of ASOs are still in the meninges. Uh, quickly, we also did the dynamics. So we knocked down uh, uh, GABA-1 receptors using GABA-1 ASOs. And using flomazenil uptake, we're able to show this uh, knockdown in receptor. Uh, last case study, um, I'm going to go to that, try to do it quickly. So looking at macrophage uh, tracking in xenograft animals, uh, we used vSense, which is a, a nanoparticle um, uh, developed by Eric Ahrens, um, do labeled with Psi7 and Flory19. You administer that in vivo, macrophages take them, and you're able to then track them. In a tumor bearing animal, we uh, wanted to see whether we can uh, use MR and uh, optical imaging to track uh, macrophages. So you see here 
uh, these tumor-bearing animals, you see a lot of following uh, administration of VSENS, you see a lot of signal in the liver, uh, you're also seeing signal in the tumor, which is basically what we wanted to prove. Uh, now, the same animals, um, when you uh, still are under anesthesia, you can see there on the left using IVIS. Now, looking at Type 7, we are seeing signal in the tumors which are close to the surface, but really not seeing, uh, uh, at least in this case, we did not, were unable to detect the liver. Uh, again, showing the you know, differences between various imaging modalities. Um, so we're looking at the tumors here. Uh, we then, the same animals were then taken down, frozen and imaged using cryofessence tomography, which is the images on the right, uh, allowed us to really uh, uh, get a, a really nice understanding on the distribution uh, and, and, and basically tr tracking macrophages across whole animals. Uh, you see the tumors uh, really nicely there. You're looking at uh, a lot of liver uptake as uh, confirmed by MR as well, but also so many other organs, uh, lymph nodes, bone marrow. So really able to nicely visualize macrophages across the whole mouse. And on the right, um, uh, you see that uh, uh, basically just a control animal. In this case, the signal was so strong, we didn't even detect any signal in the, at least with, on this scale, we're not seeing any other fluorescence. And lastly, um, and actually this was from a, a different uh, study cohort, but very uh, the same approach using vSense. In this case, the vSense was labeled with uh, a red fluorophore. Uh, what you're looking at here is the uh, looking at tumor cells versus macrophage um, um, distribution in the tumors. Uh, here, the MC38, uh, uh, the tumor cell we've been using, were expressing GFP. So we collected, as we're doing cryofresis tomography, we did white light, green channel, and red channel. Um, and eventually, we cropped, we digitally cropped those tumors out from the uh, whole mice, uh, and we're able to overlay the GFP, the TD, the, the tumor cell distribution with the macrophage distribution to get a better understanding on the relations between the two. So again, that's just also an example for the ability to do uh, um, uh, multi-channel imaging using uh, cryofluorescence tomography. With that, I will uh, end my uh, presentation. And I want to again acknowledge Amit for, uh, and say thank you for their, uh, the opportunity to present in this session. And thank you uh, every, everyone for your attention. I'm happy to take any questions.